irreverent, entertaining, cool. You're listening to LA Talk Radio. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza and Matt Polachek, only on LA Talk Radio. Hello, listeners, and welcome to another edition of Answers for the Family. I'm your co-host, Dr. Matt Polachek. Every Monday from 11 a.m. to noon Pacific Time, this show will bring you special guests that can inspire, educate, and entertain, while bringing answers and options to raising children today in our constantly changing future. Answers for the Family will address issues such as locating your runaway teen, family crisis intervention, building self-esteem, or dealing with addictions. As I'm sure many of you expect to always hear Alan's voice in the morning, we're always reminded of this reality of what he does when he's not on the air. As a licensed private investigator and crisis interventionist, he gets calls and has to respond quickly, be it locating a runaway teen, escorting a teen to a specialized program, or retrieving an abductive child. I spoke with him late last night and learned that he has to uh, go locate a runaway teen that's been exploited in, the pro- in a prostitution ring. So I want to wish um, Alan out there luck, and uh, hopefully he'll return, return to us soon. Over the past years, you know, Alan and I have covered a lot of subjects related to the family. And one area that keeps coming up is this failure to launch group, these millennials who are really challenging to work with. And to me as a psychologist, we've got to continue to learn, evolve as parents, therapists, and a community to really meet the needs of these individuals. Today's guest, based on her personal experiences in education, decided to really take action in providing resources for these young adults. We're really excited to welcome Don Bauer in today. Dawn's a certified parent coach, a certified behavior analyst. analyst. She's the director of admissions at Pasea Life and founder of the Family Hope Line. Dawn also served as court-appointed special advocate for over 12 years, a member of Women's Leadership First, and is a founding board member and camp co-director at Seaside Summer Enrichment Camp, which serves adolescent risks at use. She's a very, very busy woman. So without further ado, Dawn, welcome to Answers for the Family. Hi, Matt. Thank you so much for having me today. You know, there's there so many topics that I'm excited to discuss with you today, but let's first start with really this age group that I mentioned earlier. I can't tell you, I get so many calls in my private practice, you know, for these 17 to 30 year olds that really are just kind of having a hard time getting it together. As a professional in the field, do you think, what, is, what do you think the real kind of keys are in working with this population? Um, in, in working with them, or what has caused this? You, let's that, do, think, let's do with what's kind of caused interrelated. this. Yeah, let's, tell me both. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, one of the things that we have found is, and, and I even, you know, looking back, um, the rules have even changed in the last five years, or the demographics of what you're working with in the needs of adolescents and these young adults. And this whole millennial failure to launch is, to me, um, really that group of individuals that unfortunately remain very emotionally immature, um, probably lacked a lot of responsibility, a lot of structure in their lives. Um, I certainly think we're an instant gratification society, and I think that has, um, I hate to use this word, but it's only when it comes to mind, we've kind of dumbed down um, our, our kids, their learning. Um, I think it definitely prohibited them from exploring certain things, um, having, you know, chores, having jobs. Um, we actually in Pasea and work with, you know, 22, 23, 24 year olds who've actually never had a part time job. Wow. I can remember being 14 and being excited to actually get my first job, you know, regardless of what that was. Um, we have young adults that come to us that are 19 or 20 and have never cooked an egg, um, they've never made their beds. And so I just think that we're dealing with a group of individuals that the focus has shifted. Um, we look at comfort sometimes more than what um, the consequences of growing, those natural and logical consequences that come along with, you know, maturing and growing. Um, and certainly just that not having the responsibility. I see that parents oft- often operate out of a lot of guilt because typically nowadays both parents are working out of the home. We certainly have a higher... Um, you know, percentage of divorced families. So there's guilt certainly that comes from that. And so I think it has certainly changed the focus and the responsibility that um, parents are actually providing to their to their children. 
And so it's it even grows from just emotional, it sounds like what you're saying, development to just simple life skills when, and they don't and people Absolutely. just don't possess it. And Absolutely. It, and this was the impetus for starting the Family Hope Line in Pasilla? Well, you know, it, it's so Family Hope Line, um, I'll, I'll make that separation for you. So the Family Hope Line was actually an advocacy service that I founded in 2009. Um, just based on my own personal experience as a child, um, lost my brother when he was 16 years old. He was a special needs and was actually um, killed in an automobile accident. And because of things that had happened in our family and because of abuse that he had suffered, um, I, at a very young age, became very passionate about having that voice for those that couldn't speak up for themselves. Um, and so I really, that passion continued to grow. Um, I was married. I have three sons. And when I, when they were younger, I was always very involved, but kept even my professional career. At the time, when they were younger, I was a, a, a interior designer, had my own business, but still wanted to be able to give back. And so I became involved as a CASA in 2000 and was able to um, per, you know, be that court-appointed voice for children that had been removed from their home due to neglect or abuse. And my passion really grew from there. Well, at when my youngest son turned 14, back in 2007, um, his father and I were faced with needing to find some additional assistance for him. Um, we were divorced, and all three of my boys had certainly, you know, had their own but I would say struggles with that, but we had certainly worked with them, put them through counseling. But they were each unique individuals as well. And so we began to see a much different behavior in my youngest son. Very bright, very gifted, very impulsive. Um, and so this really prevented him, that emotional maturity level was just not coming up. So he was very angry. And then becoming involved in a program looking for his residential placement, um, that was actually at the time that the real estate market crashed. Mm. And so for me, I was faced with not only a life-changing situation with my youngest son, but also in my career. And because of my history as the CASA, um, the admission director in that particular program that was in Utah was making a transition out of the admissions department and just literally asked me if I would be interested in considering that. And the fortunate part for me was I could still live in Georgia, um, which I actually still reside in Georgia, but I could work in Utah because uh, admission work is, is by phone and computer. And so I worked with that program for two, uh, two years, but it, the whole time that I worked with them, we would have specific callers that had very specific needs. Um, and, but then they, but they were broader than what that particular program could always work with. And I always, you know, my heart grieved. I was delighted that we could help you know, so many, but I grieved for those and thought, what are, what's happening to the ones that we can't serve, that I have to turn away because I'm specifically working for one program. And so my vision was to expand that opportunity for families, to be the voice on the end of the phone that could actually help, hopefully provide some type of resource if it was nothing but a therapist in their area, um, all the way through to whether it might need to be a residential placement or a rehabilitation center. And so that's how the Family Hope Line was, was birthed. I literally, I, I tell people I was, I was probably too naive to know I couldn't do it and too stubborn to, to you know, <laughs> to not try. So, um, so from there, I literally just started reaching out to different programs that I had um, been familiar with, started doing tours, reached out and networked with um, therapists, uh, guidance counselors in schools, and even former families that I had worked with. And literally, that's how the Family Hope Line has grown from there. And so I do have a partner now. Um, her name is Wendy Riddle. And the irony to that is Wendy actually um, was the admission director that hired me in my first position. So we've come full circle in our relationship. And it, it's really cool to be partnered with her. So, and a couple of years ago, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, so I'm saying the Family Hope Line basically is, is, a, is, a, is an, uh, an advocacy group, basically. It is. We're an advocacy group. And so we literally are partnered with different programs so that when a family calls, we are able to provide a resource to that family. So Wendy is actually um, handles all of the Family Hope Line now. A couple of years ago, I began to transition out of being on the front end of the phone call and, and working um, in that that area of advocacy and became very intrigued with the young adult um, and knew Randy Oakley, our founder and CEO of Pasilla Life. And so 
uh, made that transition over and became their admission director. So it really, you know, I feel I'm very passionate about the advocacy work. Um, love that that's still a part of my life, but also love working with these young adults. My sons are all in their 20s now, so it seems a very natural transition to me as well. Because, again, I've still had this personal experience. Um, I've grown through this with my son, who, when he was 14 and entered, he's now 23. So I've gone through this whole millennial, you know, phase. I've also gone through placing. So when I speak to a family, I really have a point of relation, I think, that allows me to connect to them at a certain level and to really be able also to um, empower them to not you know, make some of the, the same mistakes that I've seen other parents make, not to rescue. And um, I really just feel that it, it's helped afford me um, the opportunity to really offer, you know, substantial guidance for these families who are calling in. And I think about as a parent myself, I think about what that that feeling must be like between you um, and your child to have to sit down and have that conversation. Um, and so being someone who's been through that experience for you, I'm sure that gives you a wealth of information and also just the emotional feeling of what it was like to to be in a position and know that your son needs, you know, a higher level of care than your household could provide. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, and I know that you had asked me with the Family Hope Line and then Pasea. Um, so Pasea is you know, that it is a young adult transitional program, um, and it serves just what you were talking about, that millennial, that failure to launch group, that 17 to, we've even had students as, as old as 35 years old. Um, we currently have a 38-year-old in, um, in one of our programs at our Portland location. And, you know, so many people, when they ask what I do, and I, and I share this with them, They'll, they'll also, if they're not someone calling in, you know, if they're asking just what do we do, it, they almost seem like, really, you know, a 25-year-old or a 30-year-old, I mean, what could it possibly be? How can this happen? And I know in the beginning of the show you asked me, you know, how these things happen. Um, we really serve a wide range of individuals. You know, we see definitely that failure to launch, that 19, 20-year-old that... Um, went through high school, may have possibly had some academic struggles, um, maybe even some emotional struggles, may have been diagnosed, may have been misdiagnosed with some type of learning disability um, or emotional behavioral disability, um, maybe even improperly medicated. You know, we do see a lot of that, the ADHD, um, bipolar, things of that nature that were diagnosed, you know, five, eight years ago. And once they graduate high school and get into college and they're thrown into a completely different environment, the structure changes. They've never really been away from home. Um, they're used to parents making all the decisions for them. They like that responsibility. They really crash and burn pretty quickly because they become typically involved in risky behaviors, um, being very irresponsible, not resting, not eating properly, certainly engaging in you know, risky behaviors as well, and certainly, you know, alcohol and drugs can become a part of that. They crash and burn, and so then families are, you know, very distraught and sitting there um, with, what do I do? And so, Pasea was um, our founder, Randy Oakley, had worked in residential placements um, for over 35 years. He had founded several programs, and he had also been a founder of a wilderness uh, recreational-based program for many years. But he just continued to see the need uh, for that population of this failure to launch. There was just such a gap in the services that were available so that when a teenager or, or you know, that 17, 18-year-old came out of a residential setting, what would be that next step for them? And so we're really that final step. I think we bridge that gap between a residential placement or a wilderness placement that for that failure to launch group to really get integrated to what real life is. Um, you know, we're focusing certainly on on an emotional part, but we're really a life coaching model. And so we're more focused on um, getting, what are they passionate about? Many of these young adults don't really have an, I, I say they don't have an answer to their, their it, you know, their why. Why are they here? What is it that they're passionate about? And so to, um, to see a life helps them discover what that is. And then through coaching and mentorships that um, that are working with them while they're in our program, we're guiding them towards that that self reliance, um, you know, that sustainable self reliance, so that no matter what life throws towards them, they've got the tools that they need in order to make good, sound, quality decisions. 
Um, we certainly focus on relationships within the family, uh, their relationships with friends. Uh, we're also looking at academic goals. Do you want to get back into college? Or maybe college wasn't right for you. Maybe a trade is better. Or are you an entrepreneur? Do you want to start your own business? Um, what are your nutritional goals? What does exercise look like for you? How do you manage money? You know, what are your spending habits? So we're really looking at an all-encompassing life will, every area that would um, be a part of a young adult's life. And many of them, when you sit down to ask that question in the beginning, they really don't know, you know, what are you passionate about? Well, I don't know. So sometimes you even have to go in the back way. Okay, tell us what hasn't worked for you. You know, what is it in the past that has really been a stumbling block for you? And so that's how we will sometimes go about, you know, starting that whole process of figuring out their life map for them so that while they're at PSEA, um, certainly we know what their goals are that are needing to be accomplished. It's amazing because it really is, it's filling the holes, I think, of a society at this point of, and a need that we have. And, and what I heard, I think I heard you say basically is for a lot of parents who, you know, aside from the parents whose our kids are failure to launch, it's really a nice step down program for people who actually have been at some of these wilderness or residential programs. Absolutely. Absolutely. We really do see two populations. Um, and, and I, I would say, it's probably about 50-50 that, that we do see um, come into us, that many have had, you know, possibly a residential placement in their past or had struggled and never did have that, but certainly still entered in and became part of this, you know, this failure to launch population. And is PASEA across the nation or do you have certain locations or how does that work? So PASEA was founded um, back in 2007. It really started. It started with two students in Salt Lake City. Um, Randy Oakley, the founder, had them in his home. It was basically almost like a, a fostering position. And what had happened is they were former students of his that parents called him and said, hey, you know, they're now 19, can't force them to go into any type of program. We're really at a loss. What do we do? And Randy said, you know what, why don't you send them to me? Um, we'll figure this out. Let me look at this and let, let's take an individual approach with this. And from there, he thought, okay, maybe this is, maybe we're onto something now. Um, maybe this is that, that gap that needs to be filled. That instead of a residential place that someone would actually go to and, you know, be in one facility, um, that's kind of a program that's geared, I, I don't want to call it that cookie cutter, but, you know, when, it, when you're a facility, you do have specific things that you specialize in. And unfortunately, in this millennial group, um, this failure to launch, you really, their needs are, are very different. There's a lot of things that are very common, but they're very different. And so he wanted an individual approach. Um, you know, he didn't want that set schedule every day um, routine because they pretty much had already been through that. That hadn't served them well. Right. So Casilla was founded um, first in Salt Lake City. Um, to take that individual approach, and it really took off. And we now have eight homes um, in our Salt Lake City area. We have two in the Park City, Heber area. Um, we also have two homes in Portland, Oregon. We also are expanding into the San Diego and Bend, Oregon area. And we have just acquired a former um, residential program in Puerto Rico uh, called, it was formerly Surf House. And so it is now Surf House to see a life. And so we're pretty excited to, to add um, Puerto Rico, you know, to our, um, to our locations. We are growing. We've got plans um, to hopefully be in Texas in the next year. And we're certainly looking in the northeastern um, coast area, um, hopefully by 2017, 2018. So we're certainly growing. There's a very high, high demand for what we're doing. There, there was a family who came into um, my practice on Friday, um, our, mm -hmm. our facility, and the, um, the this was a young man who had had great grades his whole life, high achiever. They sent him away to college, mm -hmm. um, and he just bombed, you know. Um, and mm -hmm. everything you said really clicked just, just now on life skills, being on his own. I think he was very coddled growing up. Um, and the reality of life um, kind of overwhelmed him, I believe. And, you know, he just wasn't emotionally ready, like you're saying. Um, but when a parent comes to me and we talk about a program like PASEA, a lot of times they're going to want to know as far as duration and time, you know, how long would, would my son, you know, need to be at a program like this? What's, what's kind of the norm in that realm? 
I would say our average stay is six to nine months. Um, I don't know that there's anything magical, but, you know, with that number, other than when we look historically at our students that have gone through the program, we do have some um, that will stay 12 months, maybe even a little longer. Um, we find that those are typically our students that have a specific diagnosis. Um, our Park City location in Heber, Park City, they're right there together, um, basically serves our, the uh, kids on the spectrum. So certainly that population of students that had been diagnosed with Asperger's autism, um, you know, the special needs, those students are going to require longer um, just because getting them into that structure and helping them, you have to go at a much slower pace and be very methodical in that approach. At our other locations, when we're dealing with this failure to launch, the millennial, um, six to nine months seems to be that time span that we see, you know, a lot of success. Um, we do require a 90-day commitment when a, when a family does come in, only because in that 90 days, we can at least cover um, the basis of what we do, our life coaching model, and make some type of an impact. Anything less than 90 days, they haven't been able to go through the change um, model at all. They really haven't been able to address even the reason that they have come into it because we aren't um, a rehabilitation center. We're not a detox. You know, right. we're not that residential placement. And so we see that they need at least that 90 days of that life coaching and really helping them um, remove some of the, the thinking errors that they have. And, you know, change is, is definitely never easy. Um, and so certainly there's a lot of resistance as well. So we see in that first 30 to 60 days, even though they know that they need to change, they know that there are things that they want to do to be successful, they fall back into old patterns. And so we that first 90 days is so important in really helping them to remove those blinders and then to be able to really do the work. And so the real work, I think, starts after that 90 days. Um, that's where they really dive in. They're into their routine. They they know their goals in front of them. They may have had some regression and, and overcome that. And, and they've also worked through um, some of the things and really gotten clear in their head about, you know, what direction to take, what hasn't worked, and, and where they want to go from there. Um, one of the other parts of our program that I think is really helps the success of our students is we do require our families to go through parent coaching. Um, I myself went through parent coaching and I've, I've told everyone I learned as much going through when my son was placed in the program, I learned as much going through parent coaching, I believe, as my son did going through the program. My eyes were really opened. Um, if people would ask me, you know, that, or said that I was an enabler, I was like, there's no way. You know, I'm, I'm a hold the feet to the fire. And they're like, <laughs> okay, let me ask you, do you, you know, what happens when the principal calls from school and, you know, he's, he's been called up to the office, um, and then reprimanded? Oh, well, I go to the school and, you know, sit down and they're like, right, exactly. You go to the school. And I thought, oh, wait. So I really <laughs> began to shift the way I look. And what enabling even meant, I was even confused. I thought I was, I prided myself in being educated, but um, I learned a lot and realized I wasn't, you know, that a lot of my approaches, it wasn't that they were wrong, it's that they weren't right for him based on who he was as an individual, um, his personality, his behavior patterns. And so I just learned so much. And so that's one of the things that when um, I've known Randy for many years when I started uh, Family Hope Line, and then, of course, with, when Basia was founded, I became very interested in what he was doing and, and approached him with, what about, you know, allowing me to offer parent coaching to, you know, to your family? Yeah. And that was really how the relationship grew from there. And so we have incorporated it the first 8 to 12 weeks of a student's stay in our program. We have weekly phone calls that um, we're working with, with these parents to actually help them so that they can also make some changes and adjustments so that they know how to communicate with their young adults. You know, they know how to empower them versus enable them um, to really have more effective communication, um, you know, with them. Appropriate boundaries. You know, the boundaries with a teenager are much different than that of a young adult, even the way you, you know, you communicate with them. Um, really learning some tools that, and, and a lot of times it's just little shifts. Those shifts make a significant difference in, you know, how that relationship even looks as parents 
of a young adult versus being the parent of a teenager. Um, you know, supervision has changed. You know, one of the, the number one questions that I get asked by the parents, you know, going through the parent coaching is, you know, well, what's the punishment? You know, what, what do you do to restrict? And I'm like, well, has restricting worked up until now? How do you restrict a 19-year-old? You know, you don't. So you have to start looking at things like what are the natural and logical consequences that come from their choices, but then being willing as a parent to allow them to feel that. Um, and so I think that is one of the things that has actually helped our students um, sustain the program and actually see it through and actually have success and not be there, you know, more than a year or 18 months, but to that six to nine months is because the parents are equipped. And so they're actually part of this process and this change um, that these young adults are going through. You know, and as you're talking, we've got these, once you start talking about parenting and enabling and, and all these things, our, our lines start ringing and these listener questions and people are calling in <laughs> right away. Um, and so let's, um, I want to take a little break, but when we come back, I really want to okay. get into some of these parenting things, enabling and some of the things you were discussing, because um, it's obviously piqued our listeners' interest and mine. So um, we'll be right okay. back with Don. Thanks. Founded over 25 years ago, to meet the needs of families in crisis, West Shield specializes in resolving adolescent issues that negatively impact the family. From preteen to young adult, we are experienced and qualified to help. We offer solutions which include referrals to a network of top professionals internationally that we work very closely with in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, and psychiatry. Our in-home crisis intervention care program helps to stabilize families and bring effective resolution. We are supported by our licensed investigation company that enables us to offer legal and expert services for locating runaway teens and more. Our therapeutic transportation services help to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely provided transportation to specialized schools and programs with unmatched experience and success. Simply put, West Shield Adolescent Services is the best solution when your family is facing personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585 and let us help you. Well, welcome back. We're with Don Bauer. And, um, you know, I was thinking about uh, parenting and then I was thinking, you know, Alan's not here because he goes on a lot of these kind of rescue missions where these families basically didn't pay enough attention to their children. Um, and as a uh, self um, Self, self kind of guilty enabler myself with a five-year-old, um, you know, there's the other side of the coin. There's the side of the parents who enable too much, like you mentioned earlier, and really mm -hmm. have a hard time, you know, setting boundaries and saying no. Is this kind of the, the evolution of the kids that you're seeing now? I definitely so. You know, I, I definitely feel that um, many, much of what we see now is just basically that, you know, parents didn't allow at a young enough age for um, their children to take responsibility for their actions, you know, to be accountable, um, to really provide them with more responsibility at a younger age and, you know, allow them. And a lot of times, too, there's a wounded self-worth. Um, and we actually, some parents, that say, you know, it's crazy. They think, oh, well, if I require too much of them, you know, then I'm preventing them from, from being a child and enjoying life. And actually what you're doing is, is you're really preventing them from growing and maturing and being responsible and, um, you know, and self-reliant. And so, you know, I, I don't, I, I think that it's, you know, that it's just they need to shift that perspective. Um, again, you know, I mentioned most parents are working outside of the home. You know, we're certainly much more of a, a career oriented, um, you know, for both mom and dad. And I, I just think there's a lot of guilt that comes through that. And then certainly, you know, relationships within the family, the divorce, um, relocating, you know, families move around a lot. And so I just, I believe that there's so many things that do impact the decisions that parents make. And sometimes I think it's just in the busyness. It's sometimes it's just easier for parents to do the tough stuff and not require that of their, their kids or their teenagers, which again, really prevents them from that self-reliant piece that is so necessary um, when they become a young adult. And, and you said earlier, um, Don, there's a, a difference almost between parenting a teenager and a young adult. Um, to me, that's kind of blurred. So what can you kind of take me through that a little? 
Yeah, absolutely. So as a teenager, um, well, even as a child and as a teenager, you know, parents, we're about supervision. We're about making sure that um, our kids are, you know, home at a certain time. You know, you're looking at curfews. You're you're looking at certain grades. Um, you certainly want them to be successful, but you certainly don't want them, you know, I say this in quotations, you know, to get into any trouble. Right. Um, you certainly are wanting to prevent. You know, that's what parenting is all about. When you transition into that young adult, um, even though they don't have that maturity yet, is is what we're seeing, they certainly still, there's certain responsibilities that need to happen. And I find that because that emotional maturity level has not come up, because we see that 18-year-old, 19, 20-year-old fall back into old patterns and start to make some of the same mistakes that they might have made at 15 years old or 16 years old, I think parents have a tough time recognizing that what worked when they were that age in order to um, help them see that they, you know, need to make different choices or to even, um, you know, parents often look at things as, you know, how would they be punished? Um, how can how can we prevent this from happening? And so just, you have to shift that focus. Um, with young adults, I have one of the my famous lines that I tell all my parents, she'll be sick of hearing me say this, <laughs> um, but in our, you know, every time, it, it's amazing that a 20-year-old, you know, that they were struggling at home, the parents call us with, you know, they won't get out of bed, they won't keep a job, I'm still having to pay for this, you know, they want to play video games all day, you know, yada, 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 and they call us with this, and then they enroll them at Pasilla, and about two weeks into it, their young adult is frustrated, um, you know, they don't want to change, they're kind of digging in their heels, you see those old patterns start to surface, and they'll call their parents, and they might complain, you know, well, this isn't happening, or this, you know, yeah, yeah, you're just wasting your money. This is one of the things that, that right. we hear often. And you know that manipulation is starting because the real message is, I don't want to change. Mom and dad, I want you to continue to do this for me. I want you to figure it out for me. So what happens? Mom hangs up the phone. Bails them out. me. Yeah. And they want to bail out. And I'm like, okay, so here's what you have to know. They probably are unhappy. They probably aren't getting up and involved in themselves. This, but you jump in and trying to tell them what they need to do goes back to when they were 14 years old. And they're like, so what do I do? And I'm like, so here's the, here's my, here's my advice. One, you definitely want to listen, but you don't want it to ramble on. You've got to listen. And then at some point, you definitely want to validate. I hear what you're saying. Sounds like you're struggling. Find some type of validation, you know, to let them know that, that you've heard them. And then basically you want to empower them. You know, and I'll just use, Johnny, when you were home, we tried X, Y, Z, and that didn't work. I really believe that you probably have the answers and know what you need to do. And I'm going to trust that you're going to make that decision. And then redirect them back to their coach and mentor. Each of our students has a lead coach and a mentor that's assigned to work with them. And so I always tell parents, listen, validate, um, and definitely don't forget to do that redirection. You know, certainly the, the empowerment is part of the validation or can be, but that redirection is what is so important. Don't give them the answers that they're looking for. Don't make this easy for them any longer. Um, let their coaches who are skilled in guiding them to find that answer that they actually have, but let them go through that process of discovering it on their own. And so I hear you saying, listen, validate, empower, and redirect. The, you know, it's, it's, it's that simple almost. It's, it's just, you know, difficult as a parent, I'm sure. But, um, and it sounds like parents really are a predictor in their kids' kind of failures on some level um, in this kind of arena. But what are some kind of predictors of success for us? Um, predictions of success with the students or with the um with the parents I'm with working with the, yeah with that. working with the, the students like working with our kids um well with the predictors of success with our students i think one of the things is, is as i mentioned earlier it's helping them discover their why why am i here who am i what am i passionate about and then being able to allow them to discover and become involved in those things that actually build up um, their self-esteem, their self-worth, you know, certainly working on, you know, better self-efficacy. Um, it is amazing, you know, to look at some of our students that have gone through the program. We had one young lady that um, came into our program, 22 years old. She had probably started 
I want to say, somewhere in the range of 15 jobs and blew out of them within the first couple of weeks. You know, as soon as things got very difficult for her, um, you know, she'd start calling in, she'd get a paycheck, and she felt, oh, I've got money. And, and she just really was self-sabotage. And so when she came into the CIA, she had been in a residential program. She had had certainly some a diagnosis and had some emotional challenges, but she was really very resistant to changing. Um, mm-hmm. She was very focused on that it was all her parents' fault. Um, you know, if they would have just not done certain things or if they had said certain things, um, you know, or allowed her to live her life a certain way, then, you know, everything would have been okay. And so for the first couple of months, she was very resistant to even communicating with her parents. And I worked with her parents and, and it was, you know, just watching her parents um, really go through the heartbreak because, you know, there there's certainly, as you said, parents can certainly be a part of them not succeeding, but sometimes, you know, parents are very much involved in helping that, and the young adult doesn't want that success. Mm -hmm. And so guiding those parents to understand, you know, where you back off and let that young adult spread their wings, let them figure this out. This young lady um, definitely struggled the first couple months, and then something clicked, and it was that continued work with the messages that the coaches were helping her to understand these self-limiting beliefs, the self-sabotaging behaviors that were a part of her life, like calling in sick. Um, you know, one of the things that we implement with our young adults is if you have an appointment, even if it's, you know, with your ride to go grocery shopping, if you're going to make a change, you need to give a 24-hour notice. That's real life. If you make an appointment, you have to give a 24-hour notice or there's a penalty. Right. And so we even implemented that. And with this young lady, after several times of having to pay Pasea out of her money of, and her job, you know, a $25 no-show fee or cancellation fee, um, she began to get it. It was amazing that just that little thing of pain and a natural consequence really started to shift. And she actually started to see some of the things her parents had began to tell her. And so some of the things that I see um, with our young adults is as they get these jobs, as they begin setting their own daily routine, they become responsible for themselves. Um, They, you know, I don't have anyone that tells me, you've got to be up at the clock tomorrow morning. I know based on my schedule what I need to do young adults begin to do the same thing. They're not relying on someone to wake them up. They're not relying on someone to say, it's breakfast, it's dinner time. You know, oh, get ready, we're about to have group. They really become a manager of their own life. And I I see that that is, these young adults want that. It's just being able to keep them in that environment, continue to encourage them, continue to allow them to see small successes that then become big successes. Um, and this young lady today, I want to carry you through the full story. <laughs> she actually completed our program. Her family lives in California. Um, she completed our program. When she completed, she was working two jobs. She had moved into her own apartment and was actually paying her own rent. She had bought furniture of her own for her first time ever at 23 years old and was was keeping two jobs and was just thriving. Her relationship had really gotten a lot better with her parents. There was still some work that needed to be done, but her parents had grown exponentially as well. It was just beautiful. And amazingly enough, she stayed in Utah. Um, even after completing the program and continued to work and is doing well, has actually now gone back to school. So she's doing online school to complete um, and get her degree and then also still working. And the relationship with her parents now is beautiful. Um, It was just amazing to watch this whole process, you know, unfold. But certainly, again, you know, it was the work of the parents and then also the shifts in the way that she looked at life um, and also allowing to see, uh, you know, to really trust that process, even when she didn't like it, to learn not to be so resistant. And um, that's one of the biggest keys, you know, for these young adults to not resist change, to not fear failure, um, you know, not to fear success. We see that they fear, often fear success because of the amount of work that goes into remaining successful. So I would say that, you know, that hopefully that gave you a, a uh, you know, several different things um, there. Yeah, and it's, a, adult. and it's a great story, and I bet she'll start uh, canceling 24 hours in advance also, most importantly. <laughs> <laughs> you better believe it. <laughs> you know, and, and part of this process um, um, at the program is based in this method called the Tutori Method. Um, will you kind of give us a brief background in that? 
Yeah, so um, the tutorial method is nothing more than um, it's, it's a life coaching model that our founder I came up with, it's basically a change theory. Um, it's, it's basically a different way of, of looking at life. And so it was designed to really help a young adult um, encounter and, and, and reach um, sustainable self-reliance in every area of their life, as I mentioned earlier, that life will, um, and, and what their dreams and, and their passions were. So when I, I think the simple way of saying what the tutorial method is, is it is a new way of thinking of perceiving and responding to choices in a young adult's life. I, I think that kind of goes in line with um, one of our listeners has um, just written in, um, and I'll read you the question and let you answer it, but I think it's similar to what you're discussing. And um, the listener wrote, my sister has a very negative way of dealing with her daughter and others. Her daughter is rebelling, and when I try to discuss how she communicates with her, she shuts me down. My sister poises questions in the negative. For example, didn't you hear what I said? Don't you understand how to do it? Why can't you be nicer? Why isn't your homework done? Every time I hear her do this, I can see my niece react defensively, just as I do when she uses these words with me. This is not a little issue in my mind, as it is such a conversational norm these days. Can you address how you would approach language skills with parents to create recept- receptivity instead of rejection? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, that's I, to add to that, one of the things you is probably many parents often say to me, why can't they just get it, you know? And, yeah. and the reality is, is if they had the answers and the tools, they really wouldn't be struggling. And so oftentimes with parents, but I find that parents often respond because they really don't know. So it sounds like that this, this mom could really maybe use some guidance, some, some parent coaching, um, and to really shift the way she communicates. Um, asking questions versus making statements, um, you know, that very negative, you know, why don't you listen to me, you know, um, why do you continue to do the same things? I can't remember everything that she said in there, but typically when you when you say those, like her sister said, you put someone on the defense. And so something different would be asking her, you know, why is it that when I ask you to do something, you can't, you know, why can't we, you know, why do you have to resist it? And really allowing her daughter to respond to her, not because the questions that parents are typically asking are very open and closed. You know, they don't allow really dialogue. And I think that's one of the things that needs to exist between um, a parent and a child, whether they're a teenager or a young adult. There needs to be conversation. There needs to be communication. And oftentimes those are tools that really um, are not always given. You know, many times parents are operating out of all that they know. And so sometimes just really educating themselves is, is what um, is what is necessary. Thanks. And then we've got one more for you here from Lori R. in San Francisco. Um, She says, in the 80s, a part of my marketing study required a few classes in psychology. I wrote a term paper outlining steps to become responsible for one's actions and life. Briefly, it required identifying goals, attitudes, events, and relationships. The next steps were to visualize a series of lines in the sand, and stepping over each meant transforming giant experiences into the desired outcomes. My professor in Florida ridiculed my approach as being too new agey. It's wonderful that organizations such as yours using positive creative methods to help our youth recognize becoming whole and responsible adults. Great job and so admired. This is from Lori in San Francisco. Oh, thanks, Lori. And I noticed, you know, one of the things that came out of that when I was reading it is really very um, goal-oriented approach. Um, and it sounds like uh, really Pasia is has kind of kids focus or young adults focused on, you know, specific goals, empowering, and a, and a program that's really built on kind of a positive, um, you know, not a, you know, punishment-based system. Exactly. Um, you know, I think, as we all know, you know, punishment in our life typically comes, I'm not talking about, you know, breaking the law, certainly I'm talking about in life, the choices that we make, um, there's there's consequences, there's, you know, results based on those choices. And so it's really, you know, allowing these young adults to take the risk um, that sometimes parents don't want to, to, to allow that outcome. You know, sometimes young adults don't want to feel that outcome. And so really in an environment where it's very safe, where it's very supportive, they can be themselves. Um, they can tackle those tough questions about themselves, uh, really looking deeper and into these self-limiting behaviors and really start to, to redirect themselves. Um, 
you know, certainly Pasea is one that we, we're not afraid to, um, I use this term often, we embrace the messy. Um, <laughs> change is not, you That's know, it's, it's not pretty, it's, it's not easy, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, being in the department store, you know, clean up on aisle four. I mean, every day you, you will probably encounter some struggle. Yeah. We're okay with that. Um, that's where we see work needs to be done. You know, many parents are trying to prevent struggles. We actually in- embrace those struggles. Um, we know that those need to come out in order, you know, for that growth to occur that's necessary. So we definitely are in the business of embracing the messy. <laughs> and for those out there, as we run out of time here, for those out there who want to, um, are interested in PASEA or even the Family Hope Line, what's, what's our best way to reach them? Um, you can actually go online. Um, it's www.pasealife.com, or and our phone number is definitely there. Um, you can call three eight five two zero 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 seven nine nine. And if you wanted to reach Wendy at the Family Hope Line, you could contact four three five eight nine nine eight nine three one. And we're also online at uh, thefamilyhopeline.com. Don, it has been such a pleasure learning so much from you today. The programs are, are just awesome, excellent, and, and more importantly, um, very, very, very needed in uh, today's world. Well, Matt, I certainly appreciate the opportunity, and I certainly um, wish much success to Alan and his endeavors with this um, this young lady. We've, we've actually worked with, with some clients that have been through the the trafficking and um, it's it's horrible. So I uh, certainly my my thoughts and prayers go out to the family, the young lady, and to Alan and his team. Thanks, Don. And hopefully we'll talk soon. Okay, I hope so too. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, and thank you also, listeners, for tuning in. And tune in next week when our guest Richard Aram will share the successes of Best in Class Education, a rapidly expanding supplemental education program that's achieving outstanding academic success for students in both the independent and the public school environments. And if you missed or you want to share our show with your friends, please visit our archives of past interviews at AnswersForTheFamily.com. You may also subscribe or resubmit your name to download your free copy of the Attitude of Gratitude Journal, your 21-day guide to achieving the quality of thankfulness through self-discovery. And the next time you're on Facebook and Twitter, please remember to stop by our page and check out some of our latest posts. And if you like them, please like us and spread the word. For all you listeners, thank you for listening to Answers for the Family. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza and Matt Polachek, only on LA Talk Radio.